Okay, welcome to another in our series of the Edge Provision webinars. This is test eight. We're going to take a joint topic of inflation and unemployment and ask, as usual, 10 questions. Inflation in the UK has uh, been, been variable over recent times. Go back to 2015 on the chart here, and uh, we had zero inflation. In fact, deflation was one, of the, was one of the topical questions of the time. Inflation's picked up since back towards 3%, in part because of the depreciation in sterling in 2016, which has increased the cost of imported goods and services. At the time of uh, recording this, inflation in the UK is 2.7%. Unemployment is at its lowest rate for over 40 years now. The rate of unemployment has dropped from about 8.5% in 2012 just to, just to just over 4% now. Of course, the big issue is about whether we're measuring unemployment accurately and the scale, for example, of underemployment or hidden unemployment. But uh, to have an unemployment rate close to 4% is clearly good news for the labour market. OK, so here we go. Ten questions on inflation and unemployment. Good luck. I reckon a score of 7 out of 10 is a pretty decent performance on this, uh, this quiz. Here's question one. What is most likely to increase the long run trend rate of growth and to reduce the inflation rate of developed countries? Press the pause button, have a think about the question and uh, write down your answer. Then press play and you, when you've got an answer, come back to me. So we're looking for something here that's going to increase growth, the trend growth in the long term, and also help to reduce inflationary pressure. And the best answer here is C, increased inward migration from developing countries. Increased migration increases the active labour supply, which is a key factor of in growth, and also helps to bring down inflationary pressure in the labour market, for example, by helping to relieve labour shortages in sectors such as the NHS, in construction, in caring industries and also in things like uh, farming. Here's a quick reminder of some of the key drivers of long-run trend economic growth, including investment, productivity, innovation, enterprise, and increasing the size of the active labour supply. Growth comes from increasing both the quality and the quali the quality and the quantity of factor inputs. Here's question two: What would increase both demand pull and cost push inflation for an oil importing country. Over to you, press that pause button and come back to me when you have an answer. So what is going to cause demand pull and cost push inflation to go up? And the stimulus tells us this is an oil importing country. The right answer to this question is a. Depreciation of the country's currency. Depreciation will make exports more competitive in price terms and therefore lead to an increase in exports and aggregate demand. But it will also increase the price of oil. And we're told that uh, this country is an oil importer. So if oil is priced in dollars, for example, and a country's currency depreciates against the dollar, then the increase in the price of oil will cause an inward shift of short-run aggregate supply, therefore causing cost push inflation. Question three, what is the most likely short run effect on a country's inflation and unemployment if it abolishes its import tariffs? There are the options for you on the right hand side, A, B, C and D. Press the pause button. Have a go at this question. OK, so a country's cut its import tariffs to zero. That will have an effect on both the demand and the supply side of the economy. The correct answer to question three is B. Inflation will fall and the problem will rise. Fall in tariffs. Can you visualise the diagram? If you can, you're in a good place with revision. If you can visualise a fall in a tariff or the abolition of a tariff, that means that the country can now import goods and services more cheaply, brings down the rate of inflation. However, there's likely to be a contraction of domestic production if imports take the place of domestic output. So there could be a rise in, in unemployment as a result. Best answer there is, is B. Let's move on to question four. What is most likely to increase both demand pull and cost push inflation? What is most likely to increase both demand pull and cost push inflation? Now this sounds like a similar question, doesn't it, to question two, except we're not told anything else about a country. And the correct answer to question four is, what did you get? The right answer is A, an imposition of import quotas. 
Just briefly, let's go through the other, other options. An appreciation of a, of a country's currency uh, will squeeze exports and therefore reduce demand pull inflation and also make imports cheaper, therefore reducing cost push inflation. An increase in the price of oil will cause cost push inflation, but will tend to uh, decrease the real incomes of consumers, It'll have a deflationary effect on real incomes and output, and therefore have less effect on demand pull inflation. We're not told, by the way, whether the country is a net importer or a net exporter of oil. And an increase in the cost of buying and an increase in interest rates will have a deflationary effect in terms of falling aggregate demand and less demand pull inflation. A is right, an imposition of import quotas means that fewer imports can come into a country, in a sense you're creating some scarcity in the, in the economy and that will drive up the price of imports, causing some cost push inflation and cause a switch of demand to domestic supply which potentially could cause some demand pull inflation. So the answer to question four is A. Almost halfway. Let's go to question number five. Why are high rates of inflation likely to be harmful to the economy? Why are high rates of inflation likely to be harmful to the economy? Have a go. So this is a question about uh, the effects of high volatile inflation. The correct answer to question five is C. The obscure relative price changes leading to a misallocation of resources. Again, let's go through the other options. Inflation tends to reduce the real burden of debt, although that does depend on what happens to interest rates. Inflation tends to make a country less competitive, therefore causes exports to fall. And inflation tends to cause the central bank to increase interest rates to control inflation. So A, B and D are wrong. C is right. Oftentimes in a world of inflation, uh, it becomes harder to work out which prices are rising and falling in relative terms. And the signalling function of the price mechanism can become uh, less efficient. These are the countries with the highest inflation rates in 2017. I'm sure you know that Venezuela currently is the country in the world with the highest inflation. It's almost impossible to measure, but the IMF's data suggests that the average inflation rate in 2017 in Venezuela was 652%. South Sudan came in second place. And these other countries look like their inflation rates are relatively low. Of course, it's contextual. All of these countries have inflation of well significantly above 10%. Here's question six. What is the average weighted price change illustrated by the table below? I think you could probably need a calculator for this or certainly get a pen and paper handy. This is a weighted price index question. What is the average weighted price change illustrated by the table below? So this is a question which tests your ability to calculate a weighted price index. And the right answer is D. There was, in fact, deflation, in part because the product S fell by 9% in price. And that accounts for 50% of the calculation of the index. To calculate a weighted price index, you multiply the weight, in this case, the percentage of income spent on the product, by the price index for each product. Well, those are the price indices for each product. Uh, P, Q, R, and S, 108, 106, 104, and 91. So you would multiply 10 by 108, 15 by 106, 25 by 104, etc. If you add those together and then divide by 100, it comes to 1.8% uh, less than 100, 91.2. Question 7. What would not be classified, not be classified as structural unemployment? Have a go at this question. What would not be classified as structural unemployment? OK, what did you get for this question? I hope it's a relatively straightforward question. A lot of you would have pinpointed the answer, I think. The answer is C. C, of course, is seasonal unemployment. All the others are potentially causes of structural unemployment. And here are some of the, some of the notes. You want to take a screenshot of uh, some of the causes of structural unemployment. Structural unemployment, of course, is caused by changes in the pattern of demand for labour in different industries and often caused by both immobility of labour geographical and occupational, as well as disincentives, perhaps created by the welfare system. And there can also be an issue to do with employer discrimination, meaning that some workers are frozen out of certain types of work. The longer somebody is unemployed, of course, the harder it is for them to get back into work. Hence the idea of the problems of skills erosion or atrification for the long term unemployed. Here's question eight. A country has labour shortages in some areas and high unemployment in others. 
which government policy might help to remove this imbalance? Press the pause button, have a go at the question, and press play when you want the answer. OK, the right answer to question eight is A. This is the argument for saying that if you have significant regional variations in unemployment, you might want to move to more regional pay. So, for example, pay might be a little lower, perhaps, in areas where there's a surplus of labour, and pay might be a touch higher in areas where there's a shortage of labour. Question number nine. Which measure is least likely to help a household out of the poverty trap? Which measure is least likely to help lift a family, a household, out of the poverty trap? Have a go and come back to me in a few seconds when you want the answer. So the poverty trap affects people who are oftentimes in low paid jobs, perhaps working part time or perhaps out of work. And it stops them uh, maybe taking some extra hours on at their current place of work or perhaps taking a job. One of the reasons is that the welfare and the tax systems uh, create a, a disincentive effect. The right answer to question nine is D. Moving from universal benefits, where benefits are paid out of right, to a means-tested benefit, where the amount of benefit depends on your income. Uh, well, this means that somebody whose income goes up, if they work, for example, another five hours a week, stands to lose some of their benefits. They may also start to pay some extra tax as well. The, the knock-on effect is that effectively they pay a very high tax rate. They may not be much better off financially if they work some extra hours. So the answer isn't to question nine is D. And here's our last question. Unemployment in an economy increases. What is a probable consequence? A probable consequence. Have a go. Press the pause button. Then come back to me when you want the answer to our final question. OK, and the answer to question 10, if unemployment goes up in the country, is B, an increase in the fiscal deficit. When unemployment goes up, the unemployed pay less income tax and VAT, and uh, they also are in receipt of welfare benefits. So there's a double effect here. There's a fall in tax revenue and an increase in government welfare spending. The net effect will be an increase in the size of the fiscal or the budget deficit. C is wrong. Demand for inflation tends to fall when unemployment rises. And likewise, the trade deficit tends to go down when unemployment increases because fewer people are in work, spending money, and therefore the demand for imports tends to go down. Question A has no relevance whatsoever to the impact or the consequence of an increase in unemployment. So the correct answer is B. Well done. Hope you scored uh, pretty well on that test. There are seven others in the Edge webinar system so far. So if you want to test yourself on different topics, micro and macro, here's your chance. Log on to the YouTube site and uh, search for the Edge in Economics Revision Webinars. Thanks for joining in. Take care and see you all soon.